today we'll be looking at uh, the last section, kind of the last section of this chapter. We're going to learn today through this video how to distinguish between elastic and plastic materials. What do those mean? Okay, and we're going to learn also how to find work done and strain energy from graphs. Or more like it's just a reminder of how you find them from graphs. Because in the previous video, we looked at an experiment, right? There were two setups, but this particular one we look in detail. And hopefully you got a chance to try out the lab worksheet because you need to be able to describe the steps involved in the experiment, what to analyze and things like that. Because it can be a paper two question. Okay, so today... We're going to see what happens beyond the point where the object obeys Hooke's law. Because all this point, we only see, oh, straight line, straight line, straight line, straight line, very boring. What happens after that? We're going to go all the way, at least for this wire, which is like a ductile material, means it can bend. We're going to see what happens when you go all the way to the end until it breaks. So basically, today's video is about breaking things. What happens in between, the, while you're stretching something, what happens until it breaks? Okay, so that is the goal for today's video. Firstly, let's look at this graph. You may, have, may or may not have seen this before, but we have definitely seen the first part of it. First part meaning up till this point. That's like a hook slot, springs and stuff and other stuff stretching. But the full graph actually looks something like this. But what are these dots? Let's take a look. So this is a force extension curve. It can apply not only for springs, but also for all kinds of stuff like pens and pencils and, I don't know, rubbers and all kinds of stuff. But this particular shape of graph applies to ductile materials like the metal wire that we are stretching in the previous experiment. We will save the other materials for later, <clears throat> but this particular shape, you know, with this curve here and there, is more applicable for metal, metal wires and things like that. Okay. So first thing you need to know is what we call the limit of proportionality. That's this point A right here. And basically it's where Hooke's law is obeyed up to this point. So before point A, it's straight line. After point A, all funny, funny things happen. So from this line also, you can, you can still use your f equals to kx because it's proportional, okay? So you can use f equals kx. You can find uh, k, which is the gradient of this point only until point A, okay? This one is called limit of proportion. Must remember this name are different points on the curve. Here also, if you go over the limit a bit, your object, like a spring or metal wire, will not follow Hooke's law anymore. But it's still considered elastic and that's what we call point B. It's called the elastic limit. And that is the maximum force. The maximum force is somewhere here. That can be applied so that the wire, when you pull it, go back to original length when the force removed. Beyond this point, everything will be considered plastic already. Okay, so let me recap a bit. Elastic means, let's say you have a spring, you add a load on one side, point, 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 point. Then it's what we call, you add a load, increase, increase, increase until this point. If you remove the load, the spring will go back to its original length. Okay, so now if you remove load, it'll just go back and then have zero extension again. That's what it means to be elastic. An object will return back to its original uh, length. But beyond this, what happens? Okay, so first part here is elastic region. The, the, the metal wire uh, is considered elastic. Beyond that, we call it plastic because it's undergoing plastic deformation. So for example, let's say you load until here, then you remove the weight, then uh, it will go back to somewhere like that. It will not go back to its original shape anymore. It's plastically deformed. Okay, we'll have another slide purposely on that. Anyway, so we're gonna continue on the points. Uh, then you go until stretch and stretch and stretch. Wow, suddenly it will extend a lot. And then it will reach a certain point called the ultimate tensile strength. That is the highest force on this curve. So it'll be somewhere here, F max. At this uh, ultimate tensile strength is where there's a greatest possible applied force for this curve. Any deformation beyond that point uh, is confined to the neck. Now, what does that mean? So if you are stretching an object, like say, uh, uh, let's imagine this is a metal wire. If you pull, the whole wire will extend. But until that ultimate tensile strength area here, 
then it will start to neck in the middle necking means uh maybe your your wire supposed to be like this right but now it start to neck so here will start to be smaller like that have you ever seen those things when you stretch it take a rubber you pull at that point it will get very thin uh. that is what we call necking or oh, here neck neck this part is going to break so that's a weak point already and if you continue to go down the curve you will reach the breaking or fracture point fracture basically means break la. it will occur at the weak point uh. so if if already neck until like that uh, the thing deformed you know, the permanent deformation and you cannot go back already. so this point probably will break because it's the weakest yeah so you'll break so you could do the same thing with a hairband a rubber band just take it and pull it okay kind of scary because you're like well, what if it breaks or you could take a hairpin or a piece of metal in your house paper clip if you start off pulling it a bit ah, yeah, it will go back to original shape means you still follow hook's law but if you like really deform it ah, it will just permanently turn out of shape and it will never go back that means it's gone to go on plastic deformation in the red color area already or if you have nothing to do go and pull your earphone wires until it breaks <laughs> then you have no more earphones to use so you pull suddenly it will extend a lot that means you're in the plastic region and then it will suddenly break Pia! gone fun fun thing I like to do is challenge you to break a pencil if you can by pulling this way I know I can't because I've tried this is made out of wood so you try to pull really hard it really doesn't break my hands are slipping but if I want to cheat I could maybe hit it against the table ah, something like that oh that's cheating because I use a different kind of force a, a one where I kind of do like this it's not tensile force anymore but yes you could break material and my pencil did, did, really didn't bend too much it just broke anyway so go try see if you can uh, try to break a pencil just by pulling this way pencil force just as a challenge you know bragging rights you know I broke a pencil by pulling it apart wow I applaud for you so uh, yes so this is the curve that you should know for force extension graph for uh, ductile metal wires this is how a curve looks like if you're wondering how they know the curve look like this one well the first part F equals to KX on the left side that one we know because we have Hooke's law all this stuff but beyond that all those curvy curvy thing is determined experimentally so people will do experiment and measure extension measure measure okay add a bit more load measure measure add a bit more load measure measure and they get this whole curve for certain types types of materials okay so it's not made up people do experiments and next we're gonna look at an experiment from the slow-mo guys on them trying to break a really really thick steel rod way thicker than this uh, aluminium rod I have here okay very interesting I want you to pay close attention to what's happening to the rod when it is being stretched see if you can identify where along this curve is the process at the moment let's take a look at the video what we've got here is a number 11 grade 60 rebar so it's pure steel beam basically oh, it's one and a half inches thick so it's absolute beast and uh we're gonna pull it apart. Yeah, we're gonna rip it apart using this here machine. Uh, no, I've been working on my back recently. Yeah. Ready? Ready. It has begun. The world's meatiest machine is doing its work. The hard part will be is like guessing the framing. So I've gone quite wide. We're seeing everything from what have we got like 12, 12 little runs there. On 60 kips. 60,000 pounds. It's starting to make noise now. Yeah. You it's get the good. occasional creak. Yeah. Is this going to be loud? I wonder if it'll... Oh, we'll see some visible stretching. Oh, yeah. What's that now? Step. <laughs> what are you Jeez. freaking out about? What are we at? 140. 140. <laughs> Thousand. Uh. That's like 10 megastone. <laughs> megastone? I don't know. <laughs> Just oh. go! Any day now. Oh. Go on, son. Oh, God. Look at that stretch. Oh. oh. Look at his stretching. Oh! Oh! Good lord! <laughs> My heart jumped! <laughs> Flip! Lovely clean break. Oh. 157.4 <laughs> thousand pounds. Go on, my heart rate. Right. Let's see what that looks like. Whoa. Whoa! It gets dark like a cloud of mist. Whoa. Oh <laughs> man! That's amazing!
That's the best way to clean a steel bar, is to break it in half. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no gubbins left on it after that. <laughs> and then all the stuff from above came down later. Yeah. God, that went. Oh, it absolutely did. Look at this. It, it, this is actually amazing because this bit's the, the bit that actually broke. It's really warm to the touch. So, like, you start here and it's cold and it just gets warmer and warmer and it's just like hot because it's stretched out. Oh my so much. god. Yeah. That's just from the friction. That's just from the stretching that it caused all that heat. That is really cool. Bloody hell. So, to set the machine up before you can start pulling, it has to like grip in on either end. And you can see here where the grips have just cut into the steel. And it like just absolutely completely crushes it so that you can pull it apart and you can see the little individual notches that was hefty that was scary i jumped it's amazing how it, it just cleans it takes an entire layer of itself off well it's mental because it was probably about here and then it just suddenly went like whoop, yeah. bang and, and you can see it. it's, it's sort of like necked in where it broke because that was where it was most stretched Ooh, okay that was pretty impressive breaking a steel bar with a machine well, if you're wondering, by the way, if you saw the word kip, 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 what is that? So this bar broke about 156 kip of, well, they kind of like pound force and things like that. But basically, this is the non-SI unit version of uh, Newton. So you could convert it to, it's roughly about 700,000 Newton before this bar broke. So they're kind of like pulling apart with a force of 700,000 Newton. If you kind of hard to imagine what's, What's, what does this number actually mean? Let me calculate for you. Humans, oh, let's say you are 70 kg. La. 70 kg is roughly 700 Newton. So one human, 700 Newton. So how many humans is this? 700,000 divided by 700. Wow! This is roughly the weight of 1,000 people hanging on one bar. So basically, if you have... I don't know how to do this, but if you have 1,000 people hanging on this piece of metal, only it will break. Before that, it won't break. You can still hold everyone up. Wow, very heroic. So one thing I want to point out, several things is, you notice that when they were pulling it apart, you hardly see it extend. But it's extending when they fast over, you saw, oh, suddenly increase, increase, increase. So it's extending really slowly for the first part. Then... There'll come a certain part right before I break when they suddenly see you suddenly you pull it extends so much which part of the graph is that suddenly there's a lot of uh, uh, strain in the metal and then it broke yeah and you notice like they point out this area wow this part is kind of sink in a bit because here the diameter is pretty big here wow suddenly so small and then it broke this is what we call uh, the neck of the material so extension is supposed to happen throughout the whole bar but near the end the limits of this bar this became the weak point and it started to neck in and only this part was extending now that's why this part gets smaller and smaller though. the last thing i'm going to point out to you is they said they noticed that the bar is pretty hot in other words there's a lot of thermal energy release why is that well usually we say energy is stored as uh, elastic potential energy right so stored elastic, ah, elastic energy, I'll just say that way. Usually it's stored. But when you go past a certain point, let's say when plastic permanent deformation occurs, then this energy, little bit, little bit, is starting to get lost. Lost as thermal energy. That's why in this process of trying to stretch this thing, it be, actually became hot. Because a lot of stuff happening, like the, the atom uh, rearranging, like, molecules, uh, Everything is rearranging and the scale of energy getting lost due to, you know, internal friction happening in this rod itself. So that's the whole curve of force extension. Remember, just now we looked at the front part. We start off here on the bottom. Maybe you stretch the metal bar. Past this point, even if they remove the bar from the machine, if you're here, or maybe here, if they remove the bar, it's not gonna, it's never gonna go back to its original length anymore. This is what we call here something has happened. There's a permanent deformation happening here. It's permanently deformed. Deformation. Because it's in plastic deformation anymore, you bend, you'll just stay bent. It's not gonna go back to original. Then of course they went past this part, 
the neck start to appear, but you can't really see on the camera, and then it broke. Pia! Suddenly, very fast. If you are wondering, so this is forced extension curve, what about stress strain curve? Will it look the same? Ah? Yes, it does. If I change the labels to stress strain, the curve will also look the same and you have the same key points along the curve of this uh, stretching material, uh, metal wire. The only difference is, if you look at the gradient for this part before the limit of proportionality, the gradient here is not K anymore, the gradient is Young's modulus. That's why we do experiments, we only stick to point A. We don't go before, beyond that because beyond that is just... It's just a wild, wild west. You want to find gradient also hard. You cannot just use draw triangle, things like that. <gasps> Very troublesome. Okay, so uh, for a material, we only stick to this part to find the Young's modulus. There is another difference between the stress strain curve and force extension curve. But we'll save that for the next slide. So here, we look at area under the graph. Remember? Okay, just want to refresh a bit. Force extension. What is the gradient of the force extension curve, especially for this part? Spring constant, we talked about it earlier. So spring constant can be found from the gradient here. But what about the area under the, the graph? What about, what about say, say this side? What does that represent? Well, the tip is elastic strain energy from the previous chapter and the current one. The energy stored in this material is the area under the, the graph. Okay, so we have looked at, um, in this case, if you want to find the area under the graph, let's say it's the work done to stretch this uh, metal wire to this point. Your work done can be found with uh, triangle area, so half times base is what? Uh, some extension x, some force f, so half fx. Or if you plug in Hooke's law, you will get half kx squared. And this is what we, these are the two things we've been using to calculate the elastic strain energy. Now note, 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 you can only use this in the region where the graph is a straight line. Beyond that, uh, you can't really do that anymore because if I say, what is the, the work done to stretch the material to this point? Wow, so that work done is very big. Oh. It goes all the way here. So the work done to stretch is this whole purple area here. And we can't really calculate that exactly because it's not a nice perfect shape. Is it? A, well, if without doing advanced mathematics area under the curve, it's very hard to do it. Basically, that's the idea. Okay. Uh, and also, notice why I didn't use the word elastic potential energy. Why didn't I use that word? Well, because it's not exactly elastic anymore, remember? If we go past the limit of proportionality, and the elastic limit, this can't, we can't really call this elastic potential energy. Because you stretch it, you're never going to get the energy back. It's not a potential energy anymore. You just stretch the form, gone. Okay. Now, what if you have the stress strain curve? What is the gradient and the area under this curve? Well, it is related to energy, but it's not exactly energy. If we look at this part where it's still before the limit of proportionality, it's actually the strain energy. Stra strain energy is another name for elastic potential energy or, well, a more general name for it. So this area here is actually the strain energy per unit volume. This is the extra difference. Okay, it's not just strain energy joules. Okay, previously, uh, strain energy here is joules, but now it is joules per unit volume, so maybe meter cube. Okay, it's a little bit different. So let's make a note. Here is how to write strain energy. Strain energy per unit volume of this material. So in, basically, it's more uh, applicable. So this it depends on what the volume is, and it already accounts for that. And of course, like we mentioned earlier, the gradient is the Young's modulus. This one. What happens if you go beyond this proportionality limit? Well, you will still have strain energy but you cannot just use area or triangle to find it anymore. Same problem like that. You can still stretch it beyond elastic limit, but you need other ways to determine it. Don't worry, at A levels, you won't be asked to calculate that. You just need to know what is the area, what does the area symbolize. 
Now, if you are wondering, why is this area stress, uh, strain energy per unit volume? Why on force extension is just strain, but here got per unit volume come out? Where did that come from? Well, let's, let's do a little exercise here. If I take the area under this, uh, this, this, this uh, young modulus or oh, stress strain curve, the area will be, here will be some stress. I don't know, I just put sigma. Here will be some strain. So the area will be half times the base, which is a strain. What's a strain idea? Oh, never mind, I'll just write first. Lah. Strain times stress. That's the area. And if you substitute your values in, what is the strain? Strain is extension over original length, whereas stress is force per unit area. Okay, I'm going to skip down to the middle part here because no more space up there. So the continue, the area is then hmm, half fx. It's basically half fx times, I rearrange a bit, half fx times 1 over a times l. This is just rearranging the one from up here. And that is basically half fx times 1 over v. Okay, why is this 1 over v? Well, because if you have a pipe, you have some length and then you have cross-section area, so the volume is just length times area. So that's where I get the volume come from. So this is basically, this part is the same as the strain energy, but the additional one is here, per unit volume. So that's where we get the per unit volume from. I remember I mentioned a bit, a little bit about heat. The rod, if you break it, or maybe if you break pencil, suddenly the pencil feel a bit hot. Well, that's because there's energy loss from the pencil itself. The, the uh, potential energy is kind of coming out. So here, how do you know that? Here on this left side, it's an example of a material undergoing plastic deformation. How do you know it's plastic? Because when you load it, it follow the curve, follow the curve, and to go a certain point. But then when you unload it, it didn't follow the same curve or it take a new path and come down like that. So this, how, this is how you know whether a material is plastic or not. Okay, see whether you, you see whether it take the same path going up and down. So here, energy loss. Okay, so what is the work done to stretch the material to this point? Well, if I shade it with green, the work done to stretch the material is this whole part under the graph. Okay, so if I draw the shape, it's kind of like, uh, like that. So this area is the work done to stretch the material to this point. Then if I release the take off the force from the material, it's going to go from this point all the way back to another point. And here, this is what we call the, like I mentioned earlier, permanent deformation already. So now when I release, the material that, uh, the material pula, the energy that comes out from that is this part. So here, the, the work done, or the energy release is a triangle. Uh, it's not exactly the same, or this and this is not the same. Why is that? There is some energy loss in this case. So if I take this green energy, minus this energy, then I will get what is lost, how much energy is lost. And that's actually this part, lost energy. Because, because of thermal energy or things like that, right? Because normally if I, if this uh, material is elastic, then you stretch it, it's the same area. Then you go back, also the same area. But now you stretch, it's one area, then you release, is a smaller area. So there are some lost energy which is kind of like this shape. Uh, try to draw like that. Okay. So let me just write wrap off to make it more clear. This green area minus the red area equals to this blue area. And this is the amount of energy lost when they un the object undergo plastic deformation. This is particularly for ductile materials. So basic idea is Today we looked at how you know whether elastic or plastic. To recap, you need to look at the graph. If you go and then the material, when you load it, goes to this point and then the material come back to origin, 
when you unload it, then it's elastic. But if you load until maybe a further point, and then you take off the load, then it come to maybe here. Uh oh, so that is your object has undergone plastic deformation already, already lost some energy. So, so energy lost. That's how you know whether it's elastic or plastic. Then we also look at work done and strain energy, how to understand area under the curve. If it's a triangle, we can calculate. If it's the whole lumpy lumpy section, we can't really calculate it anymore using our half kx square and other kinds of formula. So that's all for the graphs today. Hopefully that basics was good enough to help you get started. This one, compulsory, please go down to the description below and try out as many graph questions as you can. It's really hard to uh, show example and say, okay, this one is how you do it, go and solve. Because every graph is kind of like, the question is a bit different. But, but if you do enough questions, they become fairly predictable. So go try it out. If you have any questions, post about these questions in the channels, ask your friends, ask me, anyone else, okay? So go try it out and we'll finish up with one more last video looking at more breaking stuff and different kind, different types of materials like rubber, glass, and metals, all kinds of stuff. So all right, I'll see you in the next video.